Good afternoon. Welcome to today's edition of The Coal Scene. I'm Chris Hamilton with the West Virginia Coal Association and joining me in the studio today is Mr. Roger Horton. Uh, thanks first of all for taking the time to join us. Uh, Roger's taking time from his schedule to uh, come by and talk a little bit about some of the things that are going on in the industry. Uh, for those of you that don't know Roger Horton, Roger's been just a real uh, outspoken visible uh, person uh, here over the past uh, five years or so, or for that matter, most of his career, uh, talking about the uh, things that are going on within the coal industry, trying to uh, mount a, a, a very credible force uh, throughout southern West Virginia's mining industry uh, to combat a lot of the anti-coal forces uh, as well as some of the some of the, uh, the detrimental policies uh, that seem to be coming out of Washington today. Uh, Roger has about 35 years of mining experience. Uh, most of those have been at surface mine operations, but he's also uh, spent 10 years or so uh, in underground mining operations. Roger, thanks so much for, for taking time to come by and uh, talk to us a little bit about some of the things that are going on in the industry. Oh, I appreciate the opportunity, I really do. I know you've been here before and you know it seems that uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. That's and, correct. Uh, you know, it's hard to believe we find ourselves where we where we are today as an industry. You know, given all the challenges over the years that we've had, I think it's fair to say that uh, you know none of the previous challenges have ever been quite as as uh, serious or as threatening to the industry as what they are today. It's absolutely true. When when you when you look at this uh, in a perspective versus um, what you would like to call it, the, 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 the most uh, important thing I can stress to the public is to look at it this way. This is the second time in history that this government has tried to cripple an industry. The first time was prohibition, hmm. much like that today. You know, just just that's probably a pretty good way to maybe or a good place to just start to start the conversation, kind of reflecting on on uh, you know some of the things that have occurred uh, throughout our career, and uh, you know where we find ourselves today. Mm -hmm. you know, as I indicated, we've always had challenges, and you know, good strong economies come and go, uh, weather patterns change, and those things uh, have have a, an impact on you know, markets and coal production. Uh, I'm not sure throughout our career we have ever experienced a president uh, or our national administ federal administration, uh, you know, with, with such a, with such a uh, different agenda and, and with a um, using, apparently using, or seemingly using every state or federal agency you know, to, to try to ratchet down or obstruct coal, coal production, coal expansion. That's exactly right. And, and, if, and if the people don't think there's a war on coal, they're misled. There is absolutely a war on coal. I see it every day. You know, I, I have just recently learned that the men and women who work at our Holbeck complex in uh, Logan and Boone County uh, and Lincoln County have, have faced war notices. The mine where I worked was given more notices and, and it shut down almost entirely. And the economy in this area, as you well know, is based so primarily on the mining of coal that it affects every aspect of every other part of the economy. Um, from the uh, car dealerships to the mom and pop stores, all those people are feeling the effect of this war on coal, and it's all being done by an administration. And we want to know where is the justice for us? Why is it that we must endure these things when it's there's simply no reason for it? This economy can thrive. We could provide the country with the type of industries and with the type of employment that they need to employ their people, if they would just let us alone. But they won't do that, Chris. I understand. We, we probably ought to point out that uh, you, you've been an officer within the United Mine Workers of America. 
you uh, you have uh, been chairman of the of the safety committee, the largest uh, surface mining uh, operation within Southern West Virginia, and most of you live in Chapman, Logan County. In Logan, yes. And uh, the 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 mine that you worked at was in Logan. Was in Logan County. And yes. Logan, Boone, Mingo. That's that's kind of been your your operating area. Yes, it has. Uh, we, you and I, our relationship probably goes back 20 years plus. And, yes. You know, it seems like we've been on uh, sitting here reflecting over all the rallies, all the panels, all the coal forms. Uh, we, we've probably participated upwards of 50 or 60 of those. If not more. Over that, over that time. And uh, uh, y y we, we really appreciate all the, all the work, your dedication to trying to save coal jobs, trying to promote the industry. You know, we've gone from a phase where we were all trying to educate the public on the, on the benefits of coal and promoting the industry to today where we're defending it. You know, we find ourselves with our backs up against the wall uh, and we've changed the message a little bit here over the past uh, 10 years. It's just interesting to see how that's all evolved. Yeah, we're, we're now fighting for our absolute lives. And I am encouraged. Uh, I do believe we're going to ultimately win because the things that we've said in the past that there's no way that you can run this country without coal are still as true today as they were when we first said them. We have to have the coal industry to make this country safe and viable and to produce the energy that's necessary. You know, I've recently been in touch with um, Alan Gibson who for the longest time ran United for Coal out of Kentucky and mm -hmm. parts of Virginia. Alan has asked me to assume the role uh, and to absorb United for Coal into Citizens for Coal, and I've agreed to do that. By the first of the year, we'll have our board selected and we'll have a stronger voice to utilize in the chambers, whether they be at state level or at the national level, and we're gonna do even more. Um, the most important thing that anyone can do right now is to understand coal's importance to the economy. If you don't understand it, try to educate yourself because it is so vitally important. The area that I'm from, Logan, is experiencing diminishing coal severance revenues. Every county in the state, as you know, benefits mm -hmm. from those revenues. They're all feeling the effect of low coal production. And we've got to turn, turn that tide and correct that. And I think we can do it. You know, a couple of things you say uh, need, need to probably be uh, emphasized or repeated. First of all, you know, we only mine coal in less than half of the state's 55 counties. That's right. Uh, and and the, the majority of the coal that's mined in the state is probably mined, uh, you know, fewer than a dozen counties. That's correct. Uh, but yet all 55 counties receive regular cash payments from Charleston through the coal severance program. That's true. And, you know, all through the eastern panhandle and north central West Virginia where they don't even think of coal and they don't produce coal or very little, you know, all of those counties receive coal severance dollars that's returned to all 55 counties to, to support education programs, uh, you know, programs for the less fortunate and seniors. Uh, it, it's, an, it's an excellent program. It is, absolutely. And uh, we, this year, this will be the third year that we've had to do this. Through the Thanksgiving month and the Christmas month, um, through the Christmas season, we are um, working hard to raise funds to help those miners who have lost their jobs. And the need this year is even greater. Um, there have been uh, a loss of at least 5,000 miners uh, in, in this state alone. Uh, other states have lost even more. And it's important that people understand when you lose a coal miner's job, one job that reflects upon four, or depending on what county you work in, mm -hmm. maybe five or six other jobs. You know, some of our best and brightest are having to leave the state because they can't find the type of employment that they're able to do. Some engineers who have spent many hours studying, graduating from school, going to work, bright futures, all of a sudden are told, we no longer need you. 
That's not fair. Where's the justice that uh, they they should have? And, and that's just exactly the, the point I'm trying to make. There is a war on coal, and we have to step up and meet that war, and we have to win. Uh, you know, first, let, let me just let me just mention that uh, checking the other day, when you count all of the miners that have been laid off, and all those that work in an operation that have had a warn notice, uh, those numbers combined today exceed 5,000. Yes. And may even be pushing, you know, 5,500 or so of, of men and women that, that are laid off or will be laid off by years in. When you put the, the when you add to those, to that number, uh, the individuals in southeastern Kentucky, southwestern Virginia, I believe it's over 11, 12,000 sure people. Is. And that's just unacceptable. You know, these people should have jobs or be retrained to do other things. You know, we have uh, token uh, retraining efforts being presented to us now. Uh, our unemployment will only last for six months for these people, and they have to make a decision whether to stay or go because they're not going to find the type of jobs that they previously had in the industry because they just don't exist. You know that. Yeah. And and it's so hard for me to fathom why we can't get a grasp around our politicians so they'll come to a consensus that hey, we need to stop this madness and we need to stop it now and make this country energy independent and coal needs to be a part of the energy independence. I couldn't agree more with you. I mean, it, uh, you know, it's, we've heard for, geez, three or four years now that uh, when we expand the renewable portfolio and we begin to generate electricity by, by uh, other means, uh, that, that that in and of itself will create, you know, what's been known or called green jobs. Uh, and I'm not sure what a green job is, but, but if they are available, if they're out there, then we ought to be able to, to get them uh, and use them to employ people without necessarily sacrificing a coal job. Well, I haven't seen any advertisements for those green jobs yet. I don't think that I will in the very near future. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm hoping that uh, something will happen to uh, replace the jobs that we've lost. Um, what it is, I don't know. But the thing that troubles me also about this is we have a lot of people who have already retired, whose mm -hmm. benefits, their pensions, their health care, depend upon having the miners working. You see, there's no lockbox where we store our pension and mm -hmm. health care money. That money is paid to and through and by the industry mm -hmm. as they mine the coal. Well, if the coal is not mined, then we lose pension availability and we lose health care availability. Healthcare. And those are people who have worked and are entitled to this. Uh, you know, of all, all reports I see, and when you hear the uh, National Energy Information Group Administration, uh, they, they predict that there will going forward uh, still be a lot of coal that makes up you know the nation world's energy mix as you and I know the the world usage of coal is on the increase it is indeed uh, and I'm not sure people really internalize how much energy as a society that we use we depend on and that we consume and you know we used to we being coal used to account for you know uh, north of 50 percent uh, of all energy used to generate electricity, that levels down to about 40 percent today. But when you when you look at these forecasts, uh, our Energy Information Association predicts that we will continue to use about 40 percent of coal. You know, somewhere between 38 and 40, a little higher than 40 percent annually uh, for the next 20, 25 years. Even with all this. You know, even with, with all the anti-coal uh, policy that, that's going on today. 
that's still a lot of coal. It is indeed. And, uh, and you have to question, why can't it come from here? That's true. Why do we have to import it? Why are we bringing imported coal into this country? Our miners can work and produce that coal. We don't need to import coal in here. That's, that's absolutely just goofy. And, you know, anybody who wants to do that, they need a good sweet kick in the ass just for doing that. Our people need to work. Our miners are the best in the world. We have the best coal in the world. And we need to, to make it available for them to, to employ uh, and to work. Um, again, I'm going to go back to my earlier statement. Our politicians today in Congress and the Senate have the power. They have the power right now. But they're too lazy or uncaring to get together and let this administration know that what they're doing to the coalfield community is absolutely asinine and wrong. They need to come together in one mind and one accord and stop these attacks on our way of life. You know, I'm tired of people losing their jobs. I'm tired of seeing my friends and neighbors get up and have to leave through no fault of their own. They, they built homes here and invested here, and now they're losing their shirt simply because someone doesn't care about them. So our politicians need to understand this. We're watching them. We're watching them very closely. And they better come together, and they better tell this EPA to get off our back and let us work. I think that's an excellent message. Uh, no, no question about it. When you, know, when you think about of all, the, you know, all the things that are going, going, going wrong, uh, you know, particularly in coal and the loss of markets and this company shutting down, and this mine closing, you know, it's really, uh, you hit it right, the nail on the head. You know, it's the hardship that is caused throughout these communities and these individual mining families. Yes, it is. And for the most part, you know, they, they don't feel like they have the wherewithal to to respond, you know, the, the way and in, 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 the, in the form you just, you just made your points. Well, you know, I, I spoke to one of our senators here some time ago, and my message to him was, you are letting an unelected bureaucrat do what I elected you to do. And that's what they're all doing. By allowing these new source performance standards to go forward, that's what they're doing. They're not doing the job that we elected them to do. And they need to come around and understand that that's not the right thing to do. Now, you mentioned the new source performance standards. Those were the rules proposed by EPA yes. to deal, deal with, the, they're known as the climate rules. That's they, right. They require a reduction in CO2 uh, to, the, to the level to where it makes it in, impractical for new coal-fired power plants to be constructed. That's correct. You can't get the funding for them. The technology doesn't exist to reach that level of CO2 uh, production or output. And on top of that, you have the the new uh, standards, newly proposed standards for the existing fleet of uh, power generator, coal-fired power plants, and you know those require such a reduction that it'll it'll take many more of those offline. It will indeed. Not only here in West Virginia, but but in the, all the states where we ship coal to. That's correct. So we we potentially get a double hit. Well. This is my message, and everyone needs to understand this. You know, you hear of us being asked to be the world leader in reductions of emissions, in reductions of emissions in order to facilitate change and to stop climate change. All right, let's say we do, and we shut down all coal-fired power plants. It's not going to make a dent not a single dent in the amount of emissions that are going to be continuing to emit worldwide. Coal is the fastest growing fuel of choice in every major industrialized country in the world today and will be for many, many years to come. And I do believe that we need to be on the track of using our resources in a wise fashion and coal is our ticket to the future. We could continue to use coal and burn it efficiently and safely while we look for ways to deal with this. As you mentioned earlier, Chris, the technology 
just doesn't exist today to sequester the amount of carbon dioxide that the EPA would have us do. It just doesn't exist, and I don't, quite frankly, believe that it ever will or if it's even necessary, to be honest with you. Uh, and these are not just jobs affected in the coal industry. You've got other industries as well who rely upon uh, coal. The railroad industry, they're going to lose a significant number of people and are losing people now because of lesser coal shipped. You have the boiler makers who are losing jobs because of coal not being mined. You have the electricians, the plumbers, the, all the associated um, jobs that go with a coal-fired power plant are going to be lost. And these are high-paying, good-paying jobs. And I, I'm worried about the security of our grid without coal-fired consumption. I really am. Wouldn't you agree? Well, and rightfully so. You mentioned the economic impact. Uh, you know, I was looking just the other day the uh, a fiscal note the, that the United Mine Workers put on these new rules, and they they assess that these rules uh, will will cause the loss of I believe seventy five thousand jobs over the next five years. Yes, and they're in the categories you outlined. Yes, they're, they're mine workers or mine support jobs or railroad workers, and uh, you know. Steel builders, uh, you know the the uh, affiliated construction trades, uh, and uh, uh, utility workers. You know that's the first line of, of jobs to be impacted. Yes. And, and then I believe that doubles over the over a ten year period. It does. You know, we uh, have. And, and the irony, and the irony is that's all over less than one percent of world emissions. That's exactly what I was going to say, Chris. It doesn't make any sense. So it, it just, you know, not only does it just negate a cost-benefit analysis, uh, it, it's just something that's not attainable at the current time. No, it's not. And I don't think it will ever be attainable. You know, I have some friends who work in Texas, and they're proposing building a um, new coal-fired power plant. And from this power plant, they are sequest going to sequester and use the carbon dioxide to pump into the old oil wells that have been abandoned and they are bringing back to life new uh, old towns that had previously closed mm -hmm. because the oil had gone away. But through the dumping of the CO2 into those areas, uh, they're able to get more of the oil out of the ground. That, that's a limited use of it. But where you don't have that in areas that say West Virginia, for instance, we don't have that ability to do that here. It can't be done. Mm -mm. And we still need the, the coal-fired power. So uh, it just asks now for them to continue to go on with these rules. It just, it truly is. Well, and the other, you know, here, here you have a situation where world uh, 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 use of coal expands. You're going to have additional emissions from all these developing countries that uh, don't, Talk about leadership again. You know, we've been uh, basically putting on after treatment systems, scrubbers, low NOx burners, precipitators. We've been putting on a whole series of uh, clean air uh, technologies on our fleet of power plants. And when you take a look at what's going on in China and India, you know, they haven't followed our lead to date. Yes, exactly true. With, with installing or employing any of those technologies, why in the world would you think that they're going to follow our lead in destroying our, our economy for such a small percentage of CO2 reduction? Well, that's so true. And, you know, the uh, business community <laughs> is going to look at where they can make the most money that they can by utilizing the cheapest electrical source that they can. And they're not going to keep those jobs here in this country. They're going to ship them abroad. So if we, if we have to go to using costlier energy sources, then our other jobs are going to be affected as well. And they are going to leave this country. It's a no win for America for these to go forward. And there have been so many comments generated now to the EPA that they have extended the comment period mm -hmm. an additional 45 days. I think it runs to December the 31st, I think that's correct. correct. That's correct. So, public, you have the opportunity 
to submit your comment until then and let them know how you feel. And I'm hoping everyone out there will tell them exactly how they feel. That's a great point. You mentioned also the concern you have over the grid with all this basic fuel switching and the transition we're going through. Uh, you know, caused me to think that the, most of the most of the power plants that were working this past winter, when we uh, when we had the uh, so-called Arctic vortex yes. come through the polar area. vortex, polar polar uh, yeah. vortex. Uh, you used to call that February, by the way. <laughs> yeah, a few years I sure ago, did. We're, we're changing we're all the vernacular. All the vernacular is being changed on us to support this crisis period uh, from from uh, you know global climate change right now. The point I was going to make on that was, by the way, to the to the extent that the uh, global climate change is occurring, and I, I think there's probably merit to that, but then you have to drill down a little deeper and try to assess whether man's contributing to that, and it, then even further to assess, are we really in a period of crisis? And if you believe all that is, is occurring and the answer is yes to all those issues, then, then you have to... Uh, I think squarely uh, assume that it's going to require a global solution and will do so little good for a country like ours to, you know, ratchet its coal-fired generation down while everyone else elevates theirs. America looks to the world today to, for leadership. They absolutely do. But that leadership by far has been in the military arena to shore up their shores with our military might. And without coal in the mix, we're not gonna be able to do that. You know, it takes coal to make steel. It takes coal to generate electricity. The grid has to have good base load. Coal provides that. In order to keep our country secure, our grid secure, and help people in crisis, we need the coal industry to be vibrant, and alive and producing well. It's just that simple. Well, again, when world usage is up and there's signs of our economy coming back, you know, hopefully West Virginia coal can continue to be a strong, viable industry around the country, around the world. Uh, you know, you can't make you can't make steel, by the way, out of uh, out of wind or That's right. or uh, solar. So so uh, you know, there's and we we have some of the best valued coal here in, in West Virginia and, some, and a of lot finest, of it. some of the finest quality. So hopefully long-term uh, you know, marketing opportunities will prevail and you know, the industry will be sustained. We're running out of time. I want to say thank you for coming today. Thank you for all you've done. Now, you and I have been in the foxhole together for a whole number of years. We've been in Washington. We've been on the Hill. We've been through congressional hearings. And good luck with the uh, citizens and United for Coal and we'll continue to work together on these issues. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you.